Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Lori. This is Ask Dr. Lori. We're live. I'm taking your questions. Questions about anything. Whatever you want to ask me, I'm going to answer them. But make sure your questions are formatted in a way that it will be helpful to everybody. Asking me, is this valuable? Is that valuable? You know, we want something that's actually helpful for everyone. Or do you know this artist, Dr. Lori? Yeah, I know this artist, but other people who are watching may not care about that artist. So I want you to, of course, ask whatever questions you like. Yes, I'll answer personal questions too. Um, and yes, of course, I'll give appraise and information about appraisals as well. Um, but these are your questions. This is your opportunity for questions. So type them in, write them right there in the comment section, the chat, and I'm going to answer those questions. I'm going to remind you, Sign up for the newsletter. Why? What's in it? Well, a recent newsletter has my insights on jadeite and milk glass, right? I was interviewed with the spruce for that. I'm also talking about the business of thrifting and how you can make more money. So basically, that's what we're doing. What do you do when you sign up for the newsletter? Look at this screenshot. It's very easy. So this might look like what your phone looks like. You go to, of course, drlaurieV.com on your phone and you go to free. You see the the gray banner. It says free. It's the thumbs up. Go there. It'll open up this, what's called an accordion. It'll open up that accordion. And then you can sign up right there with your email. Just put your email in the box and then hit the sign up button. If you want to go to newsletters and alerts where it says right there, you can actually choose all the different things that you want to get an alert about an event. Uh, maybe you want to get an, uh, an, an, an alert when I do a new video, whatever it might be. You can do it either way, but go and get the newsletter because the information in it is going to help you. The other thing that's at, oh, we got your questions here. Here's Dan. Uh, can you tell, how do you tell an oleograph from a legitimate signed artisan oil painting? In other words, how do you sort the margarine from the butter? Okay, well, here's how you do it. First of all, what you're going to see on some oleographs, the most common oleographs, will be a relatively popular or recognizable image. What does that mean? You might see a picture that's very famous and is in a museum collection, and you're thinking, gee, the last time I was at the National Gallery, I think I saw this painting. How could it be here in my local thrift store? Oleographs oftentimes are reproductions of famous paintings. That's one. The second thing on my list of how do you tell an oleograph from not an oleograph or from an authentic oil painting um, is, in fact, so, you know, look for, is it, is it something very famous like um, Van Gogh's Starry Starry Night? I don't know. Or um, the Night Cafe or a Renoir little girl with the watering can, that kind of thing. The other thing you look for when you're looking at oleographs is I want you to take out the loop. You remember the loop. It's here somewhere. You remember the loop. So look at the loop and see if you see a consistent dot pattern. If you see, in fact, and I've talked about this in a lot of my videos about paintings, there are a lot of painting videos out there on the binge link. If you see big strokes, big strokes of what looks like clear nail polish or varnish, Dakmar varnish, you see it almost all the way across the actual paintings, you probably have an oleograph because they're trying to simulate brush strokes and they're doing it with something clear because the image is actually printed on, not painted on. If you put it, if you turn it around, the third thing on my list for how do you tell an oleograph from not an oleograph, the third thing that you can look for, of course, is the color of the canvas on the back. Oleographs oftentimes have a gray or gray green color to their canvas. That's another telltale sign. If you can't tell and you're not sure, you can always send me a picture. You can always do a video call with me. I will tell you, or you can show it to me, of course, here. So that's a great question. And thank you also for supporting the channel with your super chats and super stickers and your thanks. I appreciate that. I know a lot of you have been telling me you're helping me to do well. You're helping me to build a good collection. You're helping me with my business. And I want to thank you with a super chat or a super sticker in any amount. It's very, it's very, thank I'm very grateful for it. So think about that. Uh, who's your camera guy? I get a kick out of him chuckling with the, <laughs> What at your humor? Yeah, well, I mean, I have camera folks who, of course, are with me at many of my um, events, and uh, they think I'm funny too, I guess. <laughs> so you will hear them uh, laughing here and there, and I'm glad because we're here to make you smile. They're a wonderful, a wonderful team that I have. I'm very lucky to have them, 
And uh, of course they do a great job and they make me look very good a lot of the time. <laughs> so I appreciate them as much as you do. Did Dedham Pottery make all white crackle pieces? No, Dedham Pottery made different pieces, not only white crackle pieces. Now, when you think about crackle pieces and you think about pottery, I want you to think about, of course, whether or not you're looking at a piece that is intended to have a crackle pattern or even a crack floor, or whether or not it is actually crazed. So make sure you know the difference um, some pieces, even in the late 20th and early 21st century, are actually made to look older, utilizing what sometimes is called antiquing or that particular process. But no, you can find it in both. You can find some with it and some without it. So good question, Carolyn. Thank you for that. So for those of you who don't care about denim pottery, right, now you know a little bit about denim pottery. So thank you for the super stickers, too. I'll thank you all at the end. How about if I do that? Um, another thing I want to remind you of, in fact, is uh, we did a video and it was about Coro. It's about Coro jewelry recently. And in fact, a portion of that video got cut off. Why? I have no idea. But it got cut off. What's good about it is we do have the end of that video. So if you want to know about that particular video and that information that I was talking about, I was giving you all these, all this information about Coro. There were these earrings here, these nice floral earrings that were featured on a recent Dr. Lori live video. Um, you can watch the whole thing on Facebook. On Facebook, the video goes all the way to the end and it, it is complete. On YouTube, for some reason, I'm told that it is not. So if you wanna see the information and hear about the value, you can go, of course, to the Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Dr. Lori. You have to spell out Dr. Lori. It's the fan page. You should all be on it. Um, I hope you are anyway. You can watch it right there and get that information. So I don't want you to miss it if you wanted to know about that. Um, don't know what went, what went awry there. So there you go. That's how that goes. I recently purchased a painting of medieval, of a medieval castle. The artist's name is Furman Gill or Furman Quill. Does the name sound familiar? Levi, what did I say at the beginning? <laughs> These are the questions that are like, oh, Dr. Lori, do you know this? I mean, I, I understand, I say this a lot. I'll be happy to look at your piece, send it to through uh, a photo through my web form at drlorivee.com, go to find values, go to send a photo, and I will look at it, and I will do that. Because Everybody else who's watching probably is not all that interested in your particular artist, your particular piece, but I'm happy to help you with it. So um, in terms of it, I want you to have an understanding of what, you know, what we can do. I also want you to share the information. You know, it's for all of you. Yeah, but it's also for all of your friends and your family and people who you think, wow, those people are downsizing. My neighbors probably could be helped by Dr. Lori or gee, I just saw them and they have a big collection of Hummel figurines. You know, my sister-in-law, maybe she might want to learn a little bit more about it from a page from the website. So please share the stuff. Are you still doing the two or three item videos? Am I still? I've always done those. So basically it's my video calls. And basically what you do is you can sign up for a video call on my website. You can go right to the website and you can, of course, have a video call with me. For $49, I evaluate during the video call, which is a video call like FaceTime or Google Duo or Skype or Zoom, whatever it is, three items with the appraisals, $49 at the time of this taping. So yes, I've been doing them always. I still, I still isn't even come into it. I've been doing them regularly. I still do them, yes. So I did them today, for example. Today, I uh, talked to a US Marine who found a pretty darn fantastic painting. <laughs> and I'm gonna talk about that on Real Bargains. So uh, a wonderful painting for a song. He has a good eye, he likes it, that's great. What does the word stamp silver mean on a piece of jewelry? It can mean many different things depending on where the piece of jewelry was made. Oh, I didn't know that, yeah. So if it says just silver, and it was made in the United States, oftentimes that indicates, of course, a level of silver content, right? If it says sterling, the level of silver content is 925 parts per thousand or 92.5% pure silver. If it just says silver, that could mean, well, we have some silver in the actual piece, but it is probably not sterling. Doesn't meet that 92.5% uh, ceiling, if you will. So good question. You're going to find it very different in very different places. For example, if you're looking at a piece of silver from Scandinavia, it may say 835. And you know what? I talk about all of them on the website. You can go to the website. You can just put into the search feature where it's just a little um, magnifying glass. And it'll just say, basically at the top is a little magnifying glass. And you just type right in there where it says search. 
type right on top of that word search and just put in silver and every single thing that I have written about silver, all the videos about silver are going to pop up. They're going to populate pop, 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 all of them. And then you're going to be able to go, oh, that's what that means. It's going to be a lot easier for you that way. The other things I want you to think about with respect to silver, when you're looking at silver, look for, of course, the, the consistency of the color, just in case it's silver plate. Make sure that when you're, and this is, you know, these are the lists of the things I want you to know. The other thing you want to look for is the mark, whether it says sterling, whether it says quadruple plate or triple plate or silver itself. Maybe it says something else. Maybe it's alpaca. Do you ever hear of alpaca? That's a different type of silver style jewelry jewelry or other pieces. So I want you to look for those particular things. And yes, the marks matter, but remember it's easy to fake a mark too. So I want you to be aware of all that. Yeah, I talk about it on the website. The website, I hope you all know, is a really good, is a really good resource, right? How do you tell real jade? Well, Lisa, that's a good question too. Real jade has a lot of characteristics and there are a lot of types of real jade. Jade is very, very, very strong, very hard right? So people will oftentimes say, oh, well, you know, the carving isn't all of that, all that deep. So it probably is in fact, real jade. One of the ways some people tell it that way. Other, other pieces of jade, you want to look for different colors like spinach jade, or maybe you want to look for lavender jade, you know, so the different colors of jade will be also quite important. Not to be confused with pieces like jadeite and other types of pieces, or nephrite, for example. The other thing about jade that you want to look for, of course, is typically you're going to see it with um, pieces that hold up some kind of cultural significance, right? So symbolic pieces. Pieces like um, lotus flowers are oftentimes carved in jade, or maybe you'll see Buddhas carved in jade, or maybe you will see other types of things that relate to Asian culture, right? Um, or symbols of longevity, for example, are oftentimes carved in jade. So you want to think about that too. Yeah, good question. Good question. When you're looking at these types of pieces, when you're looking at any of your collectibles, look for condition, of course. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to be able to teach anything and everything about art, antiques, and collectibles. How do I uh, identify first edition books? Okay. Some people have trouble with this. First edition books, first of all, so say you have a book, say you have um, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind was published in 1936. However, if you're looking for Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, not only is it published in May of 36, but it's also published in June of 36. And then there's also a publication date on it of October of 1936. So now you're going, well, wait a minute. I thought it was 1936. How come they were down to the months? right? It made such an impact that they continued to do that, right? So basically what you're seeing here is you're going to see not only the date. Now, some first edition books don't have a date at all, no copyright date. Sometimes that's one of the things you'll look for. The other things you want to look for is you want to look for who is the publisher. So look for the copyright date, look for who's the publisher of the particular book, because oftentimes publishers will change hands of very famous novels, right? So you want to look for who's the publisher and who was the first publisher. Then you also want to look for, of course, condition, and you want to look for the boards, which is the cover of the book. The cover, of course, has to relate to those first original boards or the first cover. Are they cloth boards in green, the way in which Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind is from 1936? All of these things will enter into that need for you to understand whether or not you've got a first edition or not. So it's not that easy to do. You've got to do some research on the history of that particular novel, and that's where the value goes up. Good question, good question. Yeah, so first edition books oftentimes have more value than, of course, uh, later editions. Um, Harry Potter books, for example, a lot of people are looking at that. Another point about first edition books, they must have, in fact, the first edition. And I did a real bargains about some books that were found, actually a, a very famous book found at a, um, a thrift store. It was one of the James Bond books. You were surprised at that particular value. But knowing that the dust, the dust jacket was the original one and not one of a later edition. So that's going to be important, too, for more contemporary books. Good question. Good question. Are made in Occupy Japan miniature items valuable? Well, Edna, you know, people do collect made in Occupy Japan miniature pieces. And let me talk about what they are and what you're looking for. You should be looking for the terms made in Occupy Japan. 
When did, were they made? During the time after World War II, when the Allies occupied Japan. Many, many folks may have relatives. My father, for example, was in the occupation forces after World War II. So basically what you're looking, well, my mother would, my mother said, hey, you didn't marry me before World War II. And so you're over there. You didn't have enough points. So you had to be part of the occupation forces. If you had married me earlier, you would have had, in fact been able to come home earlier because married men in World War II, of course, soldiers would have an opportunity to get home earlier. Anyway, I digress. So it would say made and occupied Japan between 1945 and 1952. They should be made of uh, a ceramic, white ceramic material. They're usually hand painted. This is what you're looking for, that list, right? They're usually hand painted. They're oftentimes quite small little figurines. They usually are not very highly detailed and they usually are not very highly molded. Right. What does that mean? You don't see every curve and every crevice and every knuckle and every, of course, wrist. You basically will see just kind of a form of a hand. Right. So it kind of looks like a mitten, basically, as opposed to higher quality pieces that will show and, and um, accentuate every finger, every knuckle. That's another thing you look for with made and occupied Japan pieces. The other thing about made and occupied Japan pieces, usually they're quite small. Right. Miniaturization is something that the Japanese are very good at. So oftentimes they're quite small. Are they valuable? They used to have a little bit more value about five, six years ago. Today, a small made and occupied Japan piece. And here's where you say, oh, she's not doing appraisals. I'm always doing appraisals. My work, my life, my head just works in appraisals. How I am. That those small pieces are usually no more than between five and $15 for one. A small figural made and occupied Japan ceramic hand painted piece from the late 1940s, usually between five and 15 bucks. You could collect them. They're cute, but they're not going to get you the retirement hut in Fiji, I always say. <laughs> you know. Uh, tag in seat say tag in seat say 1926 cotton felt chair. Bernhardt Furniture Company. Liar back chair. Both seats have manufacturers tags, but just only one chair fine condition. Wow, Don. I mean, I got to I got to basically figure out what this means. So, you've got a chair it's from that particular factory. It's a liar back. Do you all know what a liar is even? A liar back kind of looks like, it kind of has this form, right? It's this form. I'm sorry, I don't have a, this is live, so I don't have an image to give you. Can't you give us an image? I can't give you an image because live and I didn't know Don was gonna ask me this question. But a liar back basically looks like a musical instrument. It's a piece that we typically see or a form we usually see going back to the Renaissance, liar back pieces are reintroduced in the late 19th century. And they're also reintroduced in the 1940s. Okay. So he has a 1920s liar back piece and it's a chair, right? It's one chair. And he's got the actual tags from the furniture company, which is good. Both seats have the manufacturer's tag on it. That's always a good thing. It's If it's a gun lock chair with the manufacturer's tag, if it's a chair by Haywood Wakefield, any of those early 20th century, of course, manufacturers. So what's your question? I got all this information. What do you want to know about it? Well, what should you look for? You should look for the tag. You should look for the upholstery to be intact. You should look for nice, hard, solid hardwoods in that time period like oak. Right. You should also look for, of course, uh, whether or not you have a, uh, an armchair or a side chair. That will matter, too. The other things that I want you to look for is I want you to actually look for whether or not if you're buying them or looking at them, are there a group of six? Are there a group of eight? Are there a group of 10? Are there a group of 12? Or do you have just have two? Or do you just have one? That's going to be important, too. So depending on the liar back chair, a liar back chair, which is a side chair, not an armchair, uh, you're probably looking no more than $85 for one of those chairs if it's a side chair. So, but seeing a picture will help me more. So that's what we're doing there. That's a good one, Don. I hope I answered your question. I kind of created a question for you. The, you know, <laughs> Pretty sure the link to buy the loop and the diamond tester is not working. My mom can't buy it. Stephanie, everything's working. What can I say to you? <laughs> so all you have to do is click on it. Make sure, you know, maybe it's something on your end. I don't know. Do you have something on? I don't know what you might have on in your settings of your particular device. But I want you to be able to get the tools to the treasure hunting kit. It's easy to find. Go to the specials and shop page at drlaurieV.com. Go to go shopping now. Click on go shopping now with those two little arrows. Click on that. It's going to take you to a page where you're going to see 
all of these pictures of the actual objects. Click on the picture. That's going to take you, of course, to the Amazon site. And then the Amazon site is going to provide you with the op opportunity to purchase the piece. But again, because you're purchasing it through our website, I do get compensation when you do that. And I do show you my recommended products. You know, 25 years as an appraiser and years before working in museums, I'll tell you those products that are going to help you to find what you need. The diamond tester has been very popular as the loop. The loop you just need. I'm sorry. And you need more than one. You need a couple of loops around. It will help you. It's a magnet to the money. You can see what you're trying to look at. You can understand what things to look at. You know, you can just spend time just looking through the loop. It really is very helpful. And they're inexpensive tools. You know, they're not like you got to break the bank to get them. So, yes, they do work. Um, do museums ever show interest in purchasing um, from individuals? How would one start that project? That's a good question, too. Many, many years I worked in museums as a director, as a curator, and I'll tell you a couple of things about museums. Museums prefer gifts. <laughs> Not gonna lie to you, they prefer gifts. Now, do they want, are they interested in purchasing pieces? Sometimes, yes, for certain pieces to plug in, right? If they're missing something within their collection, they plug it in, right? They say, okay, we really need this because we don't really have this in order to have this, this collection be, be complete, right? So, uh, oh, we've got all of the big Baroque names. We've got Rubens and we've got Rembrandt, but we don't have, you know, fill in the blank. So they like to fill in blanks. Now, how do you start this process? Get in touch with the museum and make an inquiry. Hi, I'm Soli Cat, and I want to know if you would like, if you have any interest in my fill in the blank, whatever that might be. But before you do that, research what the collection, what the, that museum is collecting. What do they have? You know, if they have every single Frank Lloyd Wright window, right, or every single painting by Renoir, and you have a painting by, I don't know, Bo Bartlett, maybe they're going to want that because they don't have any paintings by Bo Bartlett. They only have all these Renoir. So maybe they'd be interested in that. But if you're going to give them something that relates to their collection, they might be even more interested. Like, oh, we're, they're a museum that has all these Renoir paintings. Well, your family has the original drawing or the study for one of their Renoir paintings. Eh, they might be kind of interested in that, that kind of thing. I hope that's helpful. When you're looking at museums and you want to get in touch with museums, first of all, do your homework. Don't expect them to come with the mother load because most museums are, of course, trying to do good things for communities. They don't always have, of course, a lot of money to, of course, provide. So, a couple things you want to do. You want to you want to do your research first and know about the museum. You want to go see whether or not you want to, maybe you want to put something on loan. Maybe that's the second thing you want to do. You want to put something on loan and, and then think about whether or not you want to give it. But you have to make sure that you're giving a gift that they want. It isn't like, oh, I'm going to donate anything and everything to my favorite thrift store and they'll take everything. Museums are picky. And then it's a process where you have to say, okay, well, if you are going to accept this particular piece, you know, you will in fact not be able to do things like say, okay, well, if you're going to buy this piece from me, now I want you to have it on display all the time and make sure it's under beautiful light and make sure it's in every exhibition catalog that you publish and make sure it's out front for all the school kids to see, hey, if they buy it from you, it's theirs and they bought it from you and you don't have a lot of, of course, say in the matter. If you donate it, or put it on loan, you may have more of a conversation. You may be able to say a little bit more and make a couple of other requests of the museum. But yes, sometimes they do, of course, um, uh, purchase pieces from, you know, regular Joes like you and me, <laughs> you know. So, oh, hey, Stephanie fixed it. It was an ad blocker. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for checking on this, right? Thank you for going back and trying to see what it is, as opposed to going, oh, Dr. Laura, it isn't working. Your thing isn't working. Usually it's on that end. I, I don't want to go, oh, it's your fault because it's no one's fault. But usually, you know, things are working. So give it a try before you go, oh my gosh, you know, it can't be that. You're wrong. So that's good. Thank you for being so calm and patient and for trying. And thank you for helping your mom, right? Thank you for helping your mom with respect to trying to get the treasure hunt kit. So thank you very much. And thank you for the super chats and super stickers in any amount. It is helpful. It helps me to, to of course, support the staff and to make, of course, more. Thank you, Don. I hope I answered your question. Um, and to make, of course, more videos that will help all of you. I'm very, very thrilled when I get notices, comments, information, emails that say things like this. Hey, Dr. Lori, I um, 
Hey, Dr. Lori, you know, I found a hobby because of you. I have children, I have a job I like, but I found a hobby because of you. I found something that really makes me happy that I enjoy. I think that's great. I think that's great. Or I overcame an obstacle and it, and watching you helped me. Or maybe it was an illness or maybe you had some financial problems. I'm thrilled to hear that. That warms my heart. I'm happy about that. Ace had a question. Do museums ever sell items? Well, let me tell you something, Ace. Um, I've worked in museums for a long time. Museums have the ability to deaccession or sell off anything they want. You know, so yes, I have seen museums sell off pieces. Sometimes it's to keep the lights on. Sometimes it's to, you know, make sure that the education curator gets their very small salary. I was an education curator. It's not a great salary. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, they oftentimes will sell pieces um, in order to, of course, keep the lights on, keep programs going, put that money toward a fund of some other piece that they really need. So yeah, museums do that too. They do that too. So people are surprised by that. But remember, museums are businesses too. They're nonprofits, but they're businesses. So yeah, they have to be successful as well. Good question, smart. Good question. A lot going on. Using the loop, how can I tell if pearls are real? Oh my gosh, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis has a very good, fun email address. I talked to Dennis today. <laughs> today and his email address relates to one of his his sports teams his favorite sports team and i talked to him today on a video call and i do a video on how you tell if pearls are real i actually have a picture okay showing you one of the elements you can look for but i'm going to give you a list of how you can tell if pearls are real do not put them in your mouth do not put them near your teeth do not grind them across your teeth you're going to basically take away that luster which is one of the telltale signs of whether or not you have real cultured pearls the picture that, of course, we're, the producers are just showing, there is an example of what culture pearls don't look like. They don't look like that. They don't peel. So if yours are peeling or if they have little nubs or if they have little uh, scratches or, or if something looks like you're actually peeling off, like, you know, like I cook some, right? I burn a lot of stuff, but I cook some. You got an onion and you know that lousy kind of outside of that onion? Well, I cut all that away. I throw all that away. That's what a pearl should not look like, that onion, okay? That's one of the things. The other things you want to look for if you're looking for cultured pearl, consistency of luster. That's that kind of outside pearlescence kind of glowy part at the outside. That's one. The other thing you want to look for in good pearls, you want to make sure that if you're looking at six millimeter pearls or eight millimeter pearls, that most of them are all the same. If you have graduated pearls, they're going to be bigger down here and smaller as you get up there, up to the back of your neck on a necklace. But you want to look for usually the same size pearl, right? You want to look for the same color, not only luster, but also the same color, right? And if you've got any of that onion skin kind of peeling stuff, that's not a real, that's not a real cultured pearl. But I do this in a video. And as I've said before, I can do this out of my head here, but I like you to have the video because then you have to watch the video using the binge link because then it'll be, other things will get served up to you, other videos that are related by me. But the other thing is it actually will show you the, the images because I don't have the images right here for you. You know, that was just because I've got a superstar producer that, that you were able to see that image when I called it. That was just, that was lucky. <laughs> so that's what I want you to, to do. Take a look at that. But those are some of the things in this list. And this is why I like to give you lists. I like to say, hey, you know, you've got me here. I'm going to answer these questions. I want you to have the right out of my head that I know about this. Is your July 19th class about reselling sites? My... All of my classes are about reselling. All of my classes are about appraisals, right? I am doing special classes as well. I'm developing, developing them now, um, in fact. And some of them will be only about certain topics. But right now, the classes are what they've been, which is, of course, two hours of fun with people just like yourselves, learning about all different types of art antiques and collectibles and getting an appraisal of one object during the class. The classes, of course, you can sign up for the classes. At the time of this taping, they are only $39 for one person to attend the class through Zoom. And I'm doing them at 7 p.m. I'm doing them Tuesdays at 7 p.m. right now, Eastern time. But I've been putting out the ask uh, on here on, on YouTube as well as on Facebook and other social media channels, Insta and stuff. I've been asking, are, are there times that you'd like to see? You know, some people are saying, hey, you know, I work nights. 7 p.m. is not good for me. Or I don't really like a Tuesday. I'd prefer a weekend day, that kind of thing. So I would appreciate that 
knowing that because that will help me. Is there a time or a date that's better for you? But again, at $39 to have two hours to ask me whatever and to learn from everybody else's objects, that's what they are. I don't know whether or not that class is even sold out. It might be sold out. So check it out. Um, I know there are class openings in some of the other classes, but take a look. And that would be at drlorev.com. And you can, of course, find that. Um, you can find that right on the website for the classes. The classes are very, very popular and they do fill up fast. So hope to see you there, Sarah. Thank you very much for your super chats and super stickers. I've never sold costume jewelry. What are the most best popular, popular brands to start with? All right, I'm gonna do a speed here. I've done this in a video. So this shows me you're not watching videos of mine, but you gotta get watching. You have to start watching because I'm not gonna do this all the time. Trafari, Coro, um, Hattie Carnegie, uh, hmm, Alice Can Cavanis. Um, let's see who else have we got? Kramer, um, Kramer. Let me see. I'm trying to do a list for you, and I'm losing my my thoughts. Um, I said Trafari. I like um, Chanel. I like um, Christian Dior. Uh, what else do I like? Ben Amoon. Uh, I think I said Hattie Carnegie. The other ones that I like would be, in fact, um, Miriam Haskell. Uh, so that's probably five or six or 10. But basically what I want you to look for is I want you to look for quality of the pieces, Sarah Coventry and Napier. And of course, uh, many of the others that I've listed, in fact, in the not only the thrift store shopping list videos I did this on, but I've also done this on my um, costume jewelry videos. So look for those. And I have specifics about these particular ones that I want you to look for. Um, don't, you know, don't forget about these, these beautiful pieces that are very well made. Some of them are just made in France. We had one, actually a beautiful French piece in glass that uh, we had on a a recent Ask Dr. Lori Live, and that piece just said made in France. So, you know, you have to be careful. You're always looking for a brand name, yes, but I want you to understand what the quality of the object looks like, for example. So those are some of the other things that I should think about. When will people realize Dr. Lori is the queen of our field? Thank you, Matthew. I do love my field very much, and I work very hard all the time to keep current on all of these appraised values. Unlike others, you know, who don't love the field the way I do, I think. And also, you know, there's a difference, um, you know, there's a difference between someone who's, you know, gone to school for this a long time and then put all the uh, time and energy into the experience. So yeah, I do love it, but I love all of you for watching. And I love all of you because I love to hear your success and I know I can help you succeed. So there's lots of it. The other places that I, of course, list costume jewelry makers, some of the finest ones is of course on, um, on my website, on my website under, of course, research and then jewelry. Thank you, Quentin. Nice to see you too. So a lot of these folks have done video calls with me. A lot of these folks said, Dr. Lori, yeah, I had one video call. I said, Dr. Lori, I just had a video call with you because I have a lot of things for you to appraise, but you know what? I just wanted to tell you my success story. I was just so happy that I was able to succeed. And I had to do what you said. I had to wait a little while. I had to get a correct identification and appraisal from you. I had to, of course, make sure that I was putting this piece and listing this piece on the right place and the right, you know, in the right uh, 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 profile place, you know, in, in the right um, uh, online auction or other place. And that's what we were saying. Okay, Quentin, I hope to see you again soon. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing well, but you have to make sure that that's what you're doing too. And all that information I'm trying to help you with, because again, you can buy things very low and source very low and then resell them for a lot and do very well. You know, Shriner is another one of those costume jewelry designers. I've focused on them many times uh, during Ask Dr. Lori Live too. Dr. Lori, Trafari or Crown, which Trafari is worth it? Tra Crown Trafari is more common. Lots of people look for Crown Trafari. Trafari pieces in general are popular. Um, so basically it will depend on the piece. So people just say, oh, oh, you only want crown trafari. Any trafari is good. So here's an example using something like trafari. Uh, you have a piece of crystal, a Swarovski crystal piece, right? And it says Swarovski on it, or it says the little, the little logo of the swan on the back of it, right? So this is similar to this idea of tra crown trafari or just regular straight trafari, right? 
So with Swarovski, you've got that 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 swan emblem or that logo of the swan, which is known for Swarovski. A lot of people don't know that Swarovski used to use an S-A-L initial, S-A-L for Swarovski. And those particular pieces, in fact, people didn't realize that those are very valuable too. So remember, I don't want you to poo-poo the name. If you've got an original, if you've got an authentic Trafari piece, you know, crown or otherwise, you want to look for it. The other thing you want to look for is the C. So if you're looking for Trafari pieces, what do you look for? I'll give you a list. You look for Trafari or Crown Trafari, Trafari with a with a C, a copyright symbol in a circle, Trafari copyright, a Trafari patent pending, which indicates that the patent hasn't been received yet on that particular design. So you want to look for that. You want to look for, of course, Trafari pieces that are um, multicolored, right? You want to look for brooches or earrings or necklaces or bracelets or whatever, right? And I want you to look for multicolored set pieces that are pronged set with, usually it's glass versus stones or faux stones. So there's lots of things to look for with Trafari. They're very, very, of course, well-respected costume jewelry designer, as are many, as are many. I only listed a few that came off to the top of my head. Excuse me. All right. I know China is popular at the moment. How old? Hand engraved crystal stemware selling well too. Oh, is old hand engraved crystal stemware selling well too? Yeah, crystal stemware and stemware in general and anything for the bar is go is doing very, very well now. Yes, China in general has to be of good quality. And of course, even partial sets are doing well. But yes, barware I've been talking about for a long time and hand engraved pieces of crystal stemware will do fine. Now, remember, some of the pieces, if you have full sets and you have sets that match, if you have sets that have like a nice gold rim, like a Mosier set, for example, that's going to be popular. If you have sets that relate to sort of the tradition of Czech etched pieces, pieces from Czechoslovakia that are etched with a design on them. I did a video call, for example, today, which had an etched design from Czechoslovakia. Um, but stemware in general, people like. People are going, oh, you can't put it in the in the dishwasher. Oh, you have to hand it. Yeah, you do. But you know what? For entertaining, a lot of people are are bringing out the bar carts or bringing out, of course, um, putting up the um, the glass cabinet door so they can show all of their crystal, the Waterford, all of it. So I would say, yeah, it is selling quite well. Now, remember, the markets are going to change with respect to what's happening in the general economy worldwide, right? But you want to make sure that if you have a piece that's quality, a quality piece that's a collectible like stemware, it will do fine. So, and then you have to make sure you have the right platform of where to resell it, if that's what you're looking to do. So that's great. Randy, thank you very much for your super chat and super stickers. You folks are, of course, helping all of you. Anytime one of you gives a super chat or super sticker, or you go and you to my tip jar at drlaurieV.com and you and you type in tip jar, and you say, I'm going to give Dr. Lori a tip. You're helping each other too, because everybody who helps is helping me make more videos, and that helps all of us. So that would be great. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, I also appreciate the question. So keep them coming. What else have we got? I found a Christian Dior costume ring. It's missing a stone. It's slightly damaged. Can be worth something. Yes. Yes. It's worth something. What can't you find? Does it do, do they still make, does Dior still make costume? Yes. Yes. You can't find any what, what can't you find? Finish the sentence. What can't you find? Yes. The costume jewelry ring, even damaged, even with a missing stone can have value. And there are people out there who repair these things. You know, there are people out there who are repairing these kinds of pieces. So yes, don't just toss that saying, oh, it's it's damaged or, oh, it's, it has a loss. No, if it has the correct, now this is the other thing you got to remember. It has, if you're looking for Christian Dior, you have to make sure that you have the correct logo mark on the back. There are some fakes. So make sure it says, whether it says C-H-R period Dior, make sure it has the correct upper and lower case letters, right? So a lot of things. Where is that information? On the videos, on the website. So I want you to make sure that you have that. The other thing with Christian Dior is usually they're big, they're statement pieces. You know, it's Christian Dior. He's not kidding. They're not kidding around. So you want to think about that too. And then the pieces that are, of course, earlier, the Yves Saint Laurent pieces or the Christian Dior or such. Just found a 14 karat Portuguese Mina earrings and pendant because of your segment on Sputnik jewelry. Well, there you go. 
So there you go. So for what you found, thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that you did well. That's terrific. And I appreciate the thanks. And of course, I appreciate you supporting the channel, whether you're watching or a super chat or a super sticker, but you just made some money based on the videos. And that's what I want you to do. You can watch everybody else. That's all well and good and fine. But when you're going to do, when someone's going to do something for you that benefits you right here, that's what I want to do. I bought a Zia Pueblo pottery. Okay. It looks burnt. Why in the age? Okay. Well, here's a couple of things. Whether or not, did you buy a piece that is marked? Signed, in fact. Did you buy a piece? Because a couple of things with respect to Pueblo pottery. Did you buy a piece that's raku or actually is fire? It's fired actually in that way. So it could look like there's burn marks on it. That could be correct. The other thing you want to make sure, did you get a big piece? Did you get a piece that was marked? These are the things you want to be looking for in that list. Did you get a piece that in fact says it was from the Pueblo? A lot of the Pueblos, like Santa Clara, like San Ildefonso, will actually say where it was actually made and also the maker. If it doesn't say anything and it just looks like similar pieces, it might be an authentic piece. It just might be older. So you can send me a picture and I'll take a look, but make sure that you know what you're looking at. Yeah, it could be correct if it's burnt. People are thinking, oh, it was in a fire. No, sometimes that's how you actually could fire the clay. It's called raku. Yeah, nice, nice. Just signed up for the July 19th class. Great, great. So that means that there are some spaces left. Good, get on it, get on it. So I'd love to have all of you. It's a lot of fun and there's a lot of information that you'll learn from. Folks love it. And I usually go on and, of course, I answer questions afterwards. But it's about two hours, two and a half hours. And um, people like to see what everybody else has. And people like to, of course, get the opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with me. So it's fun. It's fun. I like the opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with you. <laughs> so it's it's all good. It's all good. So um, and then there are, of course, other things that are happening here, of course. Um, you know, lots of exciting stuff happening with respect to media. Is Patty the Platypus Beanie Baby still worth $200? I think that's the value that you gave to Bobby Bones. Thanks for all you do. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about this. Bobby Bones, my good friend, the radio, well, he's not only, he's radio and TV, the great media personality, he's a lovely guy. He's just a lovely guy, period. He's a nice guy. Wrote a new book, actually, a new children's book. So you should check that out. The Patty the Platypus Beanie Baby on that particular one may or may not be just like yours. What do you mean, Dr. Lori? So you're thinking, I have Patty the Platypus. Is it worth $200? Well, first of all, the market at the time that I, of course, appraised the one that Bobby showed me, okay, what the specs on that one were. So there's lots of specifications that matter. People are going, well, it's one Beanie Baby. My Beanie Baby is the same as the other Beanie Baby. No, it's not. It could have different materials. It could have a different manufacturing location. It could have different information on the tags. It could have actually different information on the actual making of the piece. For example, um, Rainbow the Iguana and Iggy the Iguana, some have tongues, some don't. Some have a razor back, some don't. So they could be very different. Patty the Platypus, for example, we have to make sure that the condition is good. We have to make sure there's no odors on yours, you know. His may or may not have been the same as yours. So when it comes to Beanie Babies, and let me tell you, there's a lot of information on my website about Beanie Babies. Which ones in which categories are more valuable, which ones are less valuable, and such. So can I say if Bobby's is still worth $200 today in this market, months later, Bobby's is probably has a different value than that $200 that I gave by a little bit. $225, that kind of thing. $215, something like that for his Yours, I have to appraise, I have to look at it, I have to evaluate it, and I have to identify it in terms of an evaluation and analysis of today's market, not the market when I actually did his. It'll be a little bit different. It'll be a little bit different, but it will depend on the criteria. I love Bobby. I do love Bobby. He's a good guy. He's a good friend. We actually had um, the same showrunner on our television shows. So yeah, we've, uh, we've, we've become fast friends and I'm lucky to have him as a friend. I like to call him a friend, so that's great. That's great. If you didn't have a chance to listen to him, he has, he has a great team too. He has a great team, Scuba Steve and the guys. <laughs> so anyway, well, I'm Dr. Lori. This is Ask Dr. Lori. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate all of your support. And we'll see you right back here next time. Don't forget the videos. Don't forget the website. And I'll see you next time.